Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. And welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I hope you had a wonderful weekend. It is Tuesday, June 5th. We are into June. We're we're into summer, and it's been feeling like it. It's been in the upper 90s here the last couple of days, which is... It's too much. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the heat. I know. I've said that before. I'm always complaining about the heat. And you're probably thinking, you live in California. You should be used to it. And you're right. I should be used to it. But for some reason, I never seem to be ready for it when it hits. So then I have to complain. And yeah. Anyway, um, I will complain for the next few months that I'm hot. And <laughs> I'll try not to bore you too much with that. We have not had an interview for a couple of weeks, and I am excited that I have one for you today. So I am interview or I interviewed over the weekend um, author Lisa Perlman about her book, Call Me Phaedra, The Life and Times of Movement Lawyer Faye Stender. So this is a, a history book. It is about a lawyer named Faye Stender. Um, who was Faye Stender? This is from the back of the book. A giant among movement lawyers from the McCarthy era to the 1970s, intent on forcing society to change. Friends could easily picture her as the heroine of a grand opera. A child prodigy, she abandoned the concert piano to become a zealous advocate for society's most scorned and vilified criminal defendants. From the Rosenberg espionage case during the world during the Cold War to militant black clients, Black Panther Party leader Huey Newton and revolutionary prisoner George Jackson, to prisoners in the Dachau of maximum security. Stender achieved amazing legal successes in criminal defense and prison reform before she ultimately ultimately refocused with similar zeal on feminist and lesbian rights. In May 1979, an ex-felon invaded her home and shot her execution style after forcing her to write a note saying she betrayed George Jackson. She barely survived. Wheelchair-bound and under 24-hour police protection, she then became the star witness in her assailant's prosecution. Awaiting trial in a secret hideaway in San Francisco, Faye told the few friends she let visit her there to call me Phaedra, a tragic heroine from Greek mythology. Shortly after the trial, like Phaedra, she committed suicide. Set against a backdrop of sit-ins, protest marches, riots, police brutality, assassinations, death penalty trial, and bitter splits among leftists, this book makes for a compelling biography, yet it delivers on a broader goal as well. An overview of the turbulent era in which Faye Stender oper operated under the watchful eye of the FBI and state officials. We not only relive Stender's story, but that of a small cadre of committed Bay Area activists who played remarkable roles during the McCarthy era, civil rights movement, including Mississippi Freedom Summer, the free speech movement, Vietnam War protests, and the rise of black power. So that is the description of Call Me Phaedra, the life and times of movement lawyer Faye Stender. It is a fascinating read. I had not heard of Faye Stender before this, and um, she was a really complex and interesting woman. She, um, you know, she was by no means perfect being being human. She made some interesting choices in life. She, um, she was so committed, and so I think that that led to some of her, her interesting choices, sometimes choices that maybe some of us would say, hmm, I'm not sure I would have gone that route, but she was so committed to her work and to her ideals and what she was doing. And she really just, man, she went to it with gusto, but she graduated law school in 1952, if I'm remembering correctly. So she was, um, 
you know, a, a female lawyer at a time when there weren't a lot. You know, there were some women who went to law school, but not all of them finished. Not all of them went on to practice. She was also a Jewish lawyer, so she faced discrimination in some ways for that. She, uh, this book, as I say in the interview, at times reads like a novel. I mean, her life was fascinating. I sometimes I read books about. Um, amazing people like this. And I think if I were to ever do something, you know, really amazing that somebody would want to write a biography about, they'd pretty much have to start with that point in my life because my life is not interesting to write a novel about. But Faze is. I mean, she's just, she's she's a go-getter from from the first. And, you know, just from the fact that she's a child prodigy, uh, she could have been a concert pianist. Her parents hoped that she would go that route. She instead chose to go to law school. Then she started focusing on civil rights. She became an activist at a really interesting time um, in our nation's history. Uh, she quickly came to the attention of the FBI. She was on their watch lists during the McCarthy era. Then the 60s came. She was in the Bay Area, which was um, kind of a hotbed of protest at the time for, you know, the rise of, there was the rise of the Black Panther movement, the Black Power movement. There were protests against the Vietnam War. There was um, free, you know, free speech. Just so many things were going on. And in college, I was a history major with a women's studies minor, and this would have been right up my alley. I would have loved to read this because uh, this is the type of history that I really, really love. Um, a little bit of social history with the biography, the personal aspect thrown in. I really like to get a feel for history through the specific lens of a person and their experiences, and Faye really had some amazing experiences. So, But I also was reading about so many of the things that I learned in my, my general American history class in college that are put into a different context because they are told through um, the eyes of Faye and the people surrounding her, you know, all the people that, that Lisa interviewed for this book. So we're seeing, we're seeing all of that the, from the Mississippi Freedom Summer from the Civil Rights Movement through the rise of the Black Panthers, in especially in the Bay Area where Faye was, but also in Chicago on the East Coast, etc. And so it really puts all of that, all of the kind of drier stuff that I learned in my general American history course, you know, with all the acronyms and all of that stuff happening in the 60s, into a context that made it more makes it more real makes it more interesting and so i would have loved to have had a book like this in my college class of course it it's a little late for that now unless i were to take it back with me in the time machine <laughs> but i'm really glad that i got to read it now so again the book is call me phaedra the life and times of movement lawyer face tender so let's turn to the interview now with lisa perlin and she can tell us more about it Hi, Lisa. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's wonderful to have you here. We are here to talk about your newest book called Me, Call Me Phaedra. Before we talk about the book, though, I would love for my listeners to get to know you a little bit. So if you could share a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Okay. Um, I was born and raised in Connecticut and came out to California for law school and have lived here ever since in the Bay Area. Um, I became first became a lawyer and then a judge, and uh, for several years now I've been an author. Wonderful, thank you so that, so much. So tell us about the book "Call Me Phaedra." Well, "Call Me Phaedra" was actually uh, the first uh, history book that I wanted to write, and I wound up um, getting involved in trying to publish the um, a book about the case that made her famous. Uh, and so that came. That wound up coming up first, and that was the sky's the limit, People versus Newton, uh, the real trial of the 20th century, which is what I had concluded it was, but had it had been lost to history. Okay, right. So that is about uh, Huey Newton, um, one of the leaders of the Black Panther movement. And then, so what was it about Faye Stender, the character of Call Me Phaedra, that uh, you wanted to highlight for this book? Faye Stender um, is someone whom I knew about before I ever started writing because there's an award given out in her name by California Women Lawyers. I was on the board of California Women Lawyers, and she was one of the founders. 
And after she died, they created this award because she was so dedicated to the underserved population, to prisoners' rights, to women's rights, uh, that they give out an award in her name to women who emulate her in their law practice. Okay. And she, as you read through the book, she is um, a fascinating woman, but also quite a complicated woman. What about her um, resonated with you while you were writing about her? What resonated the most with me is her passion for justice mm-hmm. and how that she would um, pursue um, what other people considered lost causes and, and have phenomenal results. Uh, she was uh, extremely dedicated. Uh, she sometimes uh, did not keep the kind of distance that I would have kept as a lawyer representing clients, but uh, she was very passionate about what she was doing, and she operated in, a, in more of a men's world than I did. When I graduated from law school in 1974, women were only about 3% of the legal uh, world, and mostly you did not do litigation. When she did it, here she was a criminal defense lawyer. It was even rarer to have a woman doing criminal defense. Mm-hmm. So she was a pioneer. Yeah, and she graduated from law school in the 50s when a lot of women, I mean, there weren't a lot of women, obviously. And you can tell through the book that she really, she was in a man's world. She encountered a lot of sexism. She did a lot of work behind the scenes that she never got credit for. So um, that was one thing that I appreciated about the book was getting to read all of the work and um, all of the dedication that she put into her career. Um, and really didn't get a it's lot of credit. It's about time. Yeah. Right. I, I figured it's about time that she get that credit because she was phenomenal. Even during the Newton trial, um, she was um, the co-counsel. Uh, Charles Gary got all the credit, and people, the, the press did not notice Faye Stender um, very much, and she was not um, recognized in the newspapers. She was when Newton was freed on appeal because she was the lawyer who did it. I'm going to jump in here real quick so we can take the first break of the podcast. But when we come back, we'll be talking more about this book, about Faye Stender, about some of other uh, some of Lisa's other works. So stay tuned. You are listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Always on the go, but the day just won't be one without your Hollywood fix. Let Golden State Media Concepts Entertainment Podcast take care of that. Jordan and Keith is Entertainment Tonight meets Access Hollywood. I'm Jordan. The guy laughing, that's Keith. (laughs) Yeah, I'm Keith. An all-inclusive look of pop culture. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Lisa Perlman about her biography of Faye Stender. And we just were talking about the um, Huey Newton trial and the way Faye worked so hard but was really not given a lot of credit for that. So we're continuing that conversation and let's get back to that interview. Even in that original trial, she didn't even sit next to Charles Gary. He invited somebody else who wasn't really even part of the trial or wasn't part of working on the case to sit next to him. Right. He he, he let the um, publisher of Ramparts, who just renewed his license in order to be able to sit there uh, and was not really a practicing lawyer, sit next to him and face sat behind him scribbling notes and handing them to Charles Gary. Yeah. Oh, that, that, I, oh, that made me, um, well, a little furious as I was reading that. But Well, she, she realized after a couple of years that he would never want her to be elevated to partnership in, in his partnership, and she left uh, because she was made a partner in, in an uh, East Bay uh, firm of movement lawyers with uh, Peter Frank. Right. And you quote him as, as saying to someone that she, he, she, was, she was better helping them. That was what Gary thought. Yeah. Uh, rather than being a partner. Um, so can you talk about the research that went into this book? I, I had many years of research into this book. I started 
uh, working on it about uh, the year 2000, um, and uh, I interviewed everybody that I could who knew her, or family members who who were willing to talk with me, and that included her sister and her husband Marvin, uh, Drew Sten- uh, Stender, who uh, Ramy actually she goes by Drew Stender Ramy, but she's married to Marvin Stender, who was a friend of Faye. So other friends from childhood. Uh, amazing group, probably over uh, 80 people all told. Um, some of them were her rivals, some of them were colleagues, and uh, I got a very full picture of her life and also had access to private um, collections, uh, which were very valuable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and is that where you got a lot of the pictures and things that are in the book from the private collections, or did you get those other places? I got uh, pictures from various people. Uh, one of them, Karma Pippin, who was a um, uh, the widow of her one of her best friends um, in graduate school at Berkeley. Um, Bob Richter, who was her first fiance when she was at Reed and a lifelong friend, uh, gave me uh, access to the letters that they wrote to each other back in uh, the early fifties. Um, there's a lot of a lot of uh, and her sister was really helpful and Marvin gave me access to her legal files. Uh, it was really um, an amazing opportunity. Yeah, it sounds like it. That's amazing. So Faye was uh, definitely a pioneer in many ways. You know, becoming a lawyer in the '50s as a as a wife and a mother. She had two children with Marvin. How do you see right. her her relevancy and her legacy? reflected today or or not reflected today well her, uh, i think it's, she's extremely relevant uh, i have a daughter who's a civil rights lawyer in new york and she was urging me to get this book out because of the me too movement uh, and it, it seems to me very relevant there are uh, a lot of women um have gone through in later years of uh, um, sexism and difficult situations with men Here's someone who is a pioneer. It shows what she achieved. It shows the difficulties uh, that she went through. It shows her trying to juggle being a a, a wife and mother as well as uh, a, a lawyer. I I think that uh, we need to be honoring um, pioneering women um, in the professions who didn't get the recognition they deserved back then. Absolutely, and we can learn a lot from them. Yes, I, I uh, agree. Sometimes mistakes they made and sometimes the the you know achievements. Yeah. It's a combination. Exactly. And yeah, I mean she certainly was not perfect by any means. She definitely um made some interesting choices along the way. Definitely. But she never I mean she was never down for long. She always found a new cause that she could embrace. Yeah. I'm curious, were you able to speak with either of her children was you, when you were doing research? Uh, not really. Um, her son had moved to Hong Kong, and uh, he came back to the States. I, I believe he's now practicing in Seattle. I'm not sure. Um, but, no, they were They were very, um, I think, traumatized by what happened to her. They were in the house when she was shot. Mm-hmm. Um, and originally, Marvin uh, told me that they were approached for a movie, and I think somebody may have wanted to write a book shortly um, after her death. And I don't think they, uh, they didn't really care for, um, I'm guessing, uh, the Horowitz and Collier account, uh, Requiem for a Radical, and they didn't really want for many years to participate. And when I finally, um, when I approached Marvin, he said, it's about time. Um, That was, you know, over 20 years later. Right. But uh, I don't know that um, her children are um, still over it. I don't know. Yeah, I, I was just curious as to um, as to their thoughts on their mother's legacy. And, you know, because they had a very interesting childhood, I would imagine, just because both of well, their parents... Well, they were very close. I mean, she loved her, uh, her children um, so much. And uh, that was one of the reasons um, that... Um, you know, she was very concerned near um, after she got shot as for uh, the fact that they might be exposed to danger. Yeah. So this is your fourth book. Do you want to talk a little bit about the other three books that you've written? 
sure. The, well, the first one is the sky's the limit, which compares the Huey Newton trial to other trials that are more famous from the 20th century because it was left off the list of anyone making um, such lists of the you know the 40 top trials of the century or pivotal trials of American history and there were various uh, legal scholars who've done that and journalists and it was not on any of their lists and I was really surprised when I found that out. Um, so I compared it and I thought that it was more pivotal. One of the things, uh, which was what Faith Stender thought, uh, one of the things that they achieved, the main thing, was to diversify the American jury. Um, they fought really hard in that case to get a jury of mostly women and minorities instead of the usual 12 white men in a death penalty trial, which is supposed to have been a jury of one's peers that was guaranteed by the Constitution. And that's not the peer of a Huey Newton or other minorities. Um, and so they did. They, they sat seven women. Um, there were a total of four minorities. And one of them, there was one black on the jury, and he was named by the other jurors the foreman, and it actually was the first black foreman that anyone has ever heard of, of a major murder trial in America. And and the composition of that jury made a huge difference. Uh, they People expected Newton to get the death penalty. He did not get the death penalty. He was convicted of voluntary manslaughter. People expected riots uh, if he were uh, condemned. There were no riots. And a book was written the following year by Ann Ginger, who's a um, civil rights historian uh, affiliated with the National Lawyers Guild, um, called Minimizing Racism in Jury Trials. And it was just about the Newton trial and all the work that was done um, to get a jury that um, was less biased than the uh, normal jury would have been. Uh, and that became the Bible for criminal defense lawyers nationwide. So it, it had a huge impact. Uh, and now we expect women and minorities to be on juries. Right. Um, and that was not the expectation back then. So that was huge. Um, and that's that, that, so I published that first because uh, originally when I, when I was trying to market, um, I had almost finished the Face Gender book. Uh, they said, well, nobody knows who she is anymore, and why should they care, essentially, some of the... Um, and publishers, and I thought, that's weird. This this case, to me, seems really important, and that's when I researched it and found out. So I published that first, and then people um, I met through the um, uh, through Yale, Law, uh, Yale College has uh, Yale and Hollywood every year, and I went to that event, and, and I was asked by people who were doing documentaries to consider doing a documentary about the Newton trial, and I realized that if I did that, I had to act quickly um, because people who were involved in it were in their 70s and 80s. And so I, Bob Richter, who, was, who I knew from interviewing for um, the history of the um, book and also for Faye Stender um, because he was her college boyfriend, he's a documentarian. And so I worked with him, and we have a project, American Justice on Trial, People versus Newton, that is an ongoing documentary project. It just won last year the Berkeley Film Foundation Award uh, for projects on civil rights. Oh wow! Uh, so oh. I so I'm doing that, and then because we interviewed so many people, and some of them were exclusive interviews, I wrote a new book that just focused on the Newton trial and incorporated quotes from all the people we interviewed, and that's the companion book, American Justice on Trial: People versus Newton. Uh, and then the last book, With Justice for Some, is about politically charged uh, trials of the early 20th century, criminal trials, that help shape today's America. And it really, um, what it does is it takes some of the cases that I um, summarized in the first book and puts them in the context of the 2016 election and the idea of ma making America great again, what was it like, you know, for minorities and for women, and these famous trials that people were reading about were great examples. Hmm, interesting. Thank you. Um, is Call Me Phaedra uh, out yet? I'm not, I wasn't sure on the publication date. It, it will be out on, on the 5th okay. of this month. 
And I have a book release party in Oakland on the 9th and another one uh, in New York on the 18th. Uh, so, it, but it already has been um, awarded uh, and uh, the um, best biography of 2018 by the International Book Awards. Oh, congratulations! Uh, that came out last week, uh, and it was also named in that by International Book Awards as a finalist for U.S. History and Multicultural Nonfiction. So, uh, I'm very happy about that. It got a really good review in Counterpunch. Um, so it's starting to be launched. Yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. Congratulations. I am going to jump in here again for our second and final break of the podcast, but it seems like also a really good opportunity to say, hey, did you hear that the book is released on June 5th? And guess what? Today is June 5th. So the book is out today. Hooray. Um, so you can pick that up today. But maybe first listen, finish listening to the podcast. We are going to take that second break. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I'm sure you remember that I am speaking today with author Lisa Perlman about her book, Call Me Phaedra, The Life and Times of Movement Lawyer Faye Stender. So let's go ahead and get back to that interview, to the conclusion of that interview. It really is, um, I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better subject. She had, uh, Faye Stender had such an interesting life. It, it reads, you know, pretty much like a novel in some cases, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those cases where truth really is better than fiction. Well, most of the people that I interviewed considered her larger than life. Mm -hmm. I mean, they felt she could have been um, the heroine of an opera. I mean, she was, before she was a lawyer, uh, she was headed to be uh, a concert pianist. She was a child prodigy at the piano. Uh, So, Music was also part of her life all the way through, uh, but she chose to um, take a different path. Uh, her parents were not very happy with that, but she she got interested in radical politics and um, never pursued the um, career in music until actually at the end of her life she was thinking of, of um, being a piano player, um, but she was also thinking about teaching law and, and teaching history uh, like cases like the ones that I wrote about, actually. Okay. Are you working on another book, or do you have an idea for another book, or is it too soon to ask that question? (laughs) Well, I do have an idea for another book, but I'm mostly focused right now on finishing the documentary project. We Mm -hmm. would really like to get it out. Um, uh, our, Our aim is to show the value of diversity in the justice system, because what they worked on there to diversify the jury gave credibility to the community at large to the results in the trial. Uh, instead of being us versus them, it was more reflective of the community as a whole. Today we have a broken justice system and we really need to focus on how diversity could help if we had a more diversified bench, more diversified prosecutor's offices, public defenders, and um, police departments. Uh, there would be more buy-in from the community to the work that they do. Mm-hmm. 
And it, would, it wouldn't just be that, because we have uh, one of the people we interviewed is a jury specialist, and she said when you have diverse juries, they tend to be less biased. They tend to focus more on the facts, partly because they're trying to convince each other, and they all come from different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so you yourself are a former trial lawyer and a former judge, so you've obviously written throughout your career. Um, what made you decide to start writing books, historical books? Actually, uh, what I wanted to do after I got off the bench was to um, write a book that would have been, I thought, a fairly simple type of book that had a chapter a piece on famous lawyers in California, who trial lawyers, um, whose careers were over, um, and just do a chapter a piece. And I was looking for the names of women to include in that because it was they were so rare. And I went to this program on uh, trial lawyers that was a judges and lawyers program uh, in Northern California. And I was astonished that the people on the program had come up with no names of women. And that's when I asked Marilyn Patel, who was the the first woman chief judge of the Northern District of California, if she could name someone, and immediately she named Faye Stender. And I'd heard of her through California Women Lawyers, but I didn't know much about her, and I I figured she had great challenges um, because she was a generation before me, and we still had challenges. And when I started researching her, um, I realized that she deserved a book all to herself. Mm-hmm. Um, and that she she couldn't just fit into a chapter with other people who had more con- men who had more conventional routes to um, their success, and so I got deeply involved in that, and that turned into uh, a book. But what really motivated me to keep going were my two um, successive editors because they're fantastic, and they helped me um, unlearn a lot of bad habits as a lawyer and a judge. Uh, which make uh, our prose very awkward. Um, in the law, you want to always use the same words to uh, to characterize something so that everybody knows you're talking about the same thing. When you write for the public, you want to vary it. Right. Uh, you want to write more simply. You don't want to use the passive. Then you don't want to use gerunds. Or they have a list of things that you don't do, which I was probably doing all the time. Um, so it was very helpful to have their feedback and their interest. They they became very uh, supportive of my project, um, not on, because of its um, subject matter as well as um, them helping me improve the way I wrote it about it, and that encouraged me. Mm-hmm. Would you ever consider writing more of a memoir type book about your own experiences with the law? I uh, hadn't. No. Okay. <laughs> Um, I do write little books for my family, though. I wrote well, I wrote a family history for my father-in-law. I write little books for my grandchildren. Oh, um, wonderful. Just family books. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Yes, I think that any that most people um, have um, unique experiences that um, they could consider writing about. Um, but I think it should be something unique. Why, why are you writing about it? Well, what do you have to contribute to the world about it? Um, and you don't have to, I think I had a writer's block at the beginning envisioning a book, but you don't have to start at the beginning. You can just start at the part that you, um, that, that feels comfortable and then go backward. The hardest thing and the, and the most reworked thing in, in my books was the first chapter. Okay, thank you. When you have time to read for yourself, do you have favorite authors and or genres? Uh, Yes, well, of course, uh, I don't read a lot for myself anymore because what I have been reading while writing these books are history books that relate to the topics um, I'm writing about, Mm -hmm. um, which I love. So, but I love history um, I love mysteries, um, uh, history uh, authors that I admire, Barbara Tuckman, um, Ron Chernow, uh, Simon Batts, um, and some of the um, lesser-known authors who just wrote, and not necessarily a long book, but they, but they felt it was important to, to write about what they observed. And then you find them through the Internet, um, 
and they're gems. Um, so they were helpful to me when I was writing my books. Um, just someone who was like a good friend of Clarence Darrow and observed him uh, in two trials, um, and just put down a lot of notes about that into a, into a, a short book um, pamphlet. I like uh, authors like uh, Greg Isles uh, and James Lee Burke. I love uh, John Grisham about the South, Michael Connolly, uh, Sue Grafton. A lot of murder mysteries. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Thank you so much for that. Um, where can people, uh, I know you have a website, so could you give us your website and uh, any social media that you are available on? Okay, www.lisaperlman.com is a website, and I'm on Facebook, um, Lisa Perlman, um, author, I think it's, uh, I don't remember the other part of that. Okay, <laughs> not a problem. I can, um, I'll, I'll look that up and make sure I include that in, in the information when I, when I put the episode out. What All else right. would you like people to know? Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you really want people to know about um, your books or your writing? Yes, I. my hope with um, uh, both American Justice on Trial, uh, which has been called a, a world-changing true story, um, and uh, with Justice for Some, is to help people realize how much it matters that they get actively engaged and how much of a difference people made when they did. Um, American Justice on Trial, they, a lot of young teenagers and people in their 20s circled the courthouse in the first movement trial. And because of the focus they put on that trial, it really motivated the judge and the prosecutor to, to showcase American Justice at its best because there was a, a, such a spotlight on it. Um, and these individual situations can really um, be um, brought to public consciousness, uh, especially through social media these days. But people need to be as motivated as they can and as passionate they, as they can be about uh, America living up to its ideals. I really think these books belong in college curricula, and I would love to see more people recommend them. Um, for that purpose, because these are stories we didn't learn in high school that we weren't taught, uh, most of us in college either, that we should know about our own history and um, think about. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, the documentary, I didn't ask you this before, uh, where can people find that? Is it out now, or when it comes out, where will people well, be able to... The documentary has a, a website of its own, www.americanjusticeontrial.com. All right. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. So, um, Lisa, I want to thank you so much for joining me today, taking some time out of your weekend to talk about the book. I, um, like I said, it, it read for me like a novel in a lot of places. So thank you so much for writing it and for all of the work that you've done in bringing um, so many important aspects of this part of history to life. Thank you so very much. Thank you once again to my guest, Lisa Perlman. As a reminder, the book, Call Me Phaedra, is out today, June 5th. I also have three copies of the book to give away. So if you are interested in history, in women's history, in a fascinating uh, period during American history, um, then this really is a wonderful, informative, and engaging book. So all you have to do in order to enter in, enter to be, for a chance to win a copy, excuse me, my goodness, is just go to one of our, our social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. That information is in the, the show description for those links, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, and comment on the post with episode 88, Interview with Lisa Perlman. That's all you have to do. Just comment on episode 88, and you will automatically be entered to win a copy of Call Me Phaedra. So that giveaway will go until next Saturday, with winners being announced the following Monday. So that is Saturday the 16th, winners announced on Monday the 18th. So please, if you're interested, go and join that giveaway. Again, thank you to Lisa Perlman. I really appreciate her being here, her taking the time out of her weekend to talk to me. And um, 
history is one of my favorite things. So I really loved reading this book. I hope that you enjoyed listening to Lisa talk about not only this book, but her other books, her documentary. I hope you'll take some time to check out those books and her documentary because they all sound really interesting. And I hope that you will join me again on Thursday. I am continuing last Thursday's episode with some more World War II historical fiction. So I'm excited about that. I hope you are as well. In the meantime, I hope that you will go out there and get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.